Why wouldn't God want every one of us to know our calling and walk it out? He does. And if we do that in the church, it's, it's got to flourish. It's got to have an impact on this whole region. So we're aiming for the, the not yet to come into the now through the power of revelation, through the Holy Spirit. Some of you are looking at me a little quizzically. That's okay. It's early. <laughs> Romans 8 says, I'm still sticking with your eyes will be enlightened. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the de dead dwells in you. Yeah. Who's the him? Somebody said Jesus, but that's not what it says. It says, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. So the Father gave you his spirit. That's what this says. It's King James Version. It's not some weird translation. God the Father put his spirit inside of you. That's mind-boggling, isn't it? But then we also know through his spirit, right, that's, that's how he gives life to our mortal bodies. I have a mortal body, but there's life in here from God that keeps me anti-gravity. <laughs> we serve an anti-gravity God, right? Like, come on, Lucy, 90 years old, one of the first ones here every Sunday morning to come in and pray. Anti-gravity God. It's amazing, right? Galatians 4, though, I put double portion, father and son, because it also says in Galatians 4, 6, because you are sons and daughters, of course, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. So we have the spirit of the father and the spirit of the son. I'm excited about that. I think that's the best news I heard all day. And a reason to be filled with hope and not despair. 2 Corinthians 4 says, so we have no reason to despair. See if we can pull the not yet into the now and say, yeah, it might be a rough situation I'm going through, but the Bible said I would get some persecution. I'm willing to take a stand. This was how the early church grew. There was nothing the world could offer them that was better than what they knew they got when they got saved. They knew there was a resurrection coming on the other side of death. Many of them put right on their tombstones, resurgum, which is the word resurrection in Latin. I know I'm coming up out of this thing. <laughs> and we kind of lost a little bit of that along the years, over the centuries. And, and we just, again, think like, well, at least I got in. I know my name's in the Lamb's Book of Life, and I won't go down that trail. But no, we have no reason to despair in this age, the now and the not yet. So that's what I mean by resolving this. Like, there, there can be a confusion among people. Sometimes they'll read in, in Matthew 13, there's parable after parable. The kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like this. Not, not realizing that Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God in operation in this world. It's like a mustard seed. It's the smallest of all seeds, but it grows into this big tree. That's the kingdom in the earth. Why else would Jesus who never went more than, what, 30 miles away from his home. He was a carpenter much longer than he was in ministry, never went to any formal schooling, and he's still considered the greatest ethical writer of all time, and he didn't even write it. Never wrote a book. Number one of all time, right? The Sermon on the Mount is considered by secular philosophers the greatest discourse on ethics. How could that be? There's got to be an unfair advantage somewhere, and it's called the Holy Spirit. The truth and the Holy Spirit. And these Christians were so different than the pagans around them that the pagans were just attracted to the peace they were carrying and the power that they saw demonstrated. If you read Acts 8, the, the, that, you know, the Samaritans were kind of the outcast people from the Jews. Philip goes right down there as one of the elders and starts healing people. And they're seeing miracles happen. Why wouldn't God want us to be those people doing that today? Well, of course he does. Will we, will we be right 100% of the time? No. But that's not what this is about. It's not about my personal reputation. Oh, it might make us look bad. Remember that clip from Ken Fish? We talked about last week when Peter Wagner and John Wimmer were running a class and people were getting healed. They got fired because people were getting healed in their class and delivered from demons. So what's the thinking there? Let them keep their demons. It's making us look bad. We're going to be accountable for that can't be about my reputation. Just obedience, right? Blessing comes from obedience. Yeah. Hallelujah. We have no reason to despair. 
despite the fact that our outer humanity is falling apart and decaying, oh, well, there's gravity again. It just keeps wanting to pull us down into the dust. From dust you came, you got raised up, and it just keeps trying to pull us down. No, God is anti-gravity. Despite the fact that the outer humanity is falling apart and decaying, our inner humanity is breathing in new life every day. That's a good picture of the not yet coming into the now. You see, the short-lived pains of this life are creating for us an eternal glory that does not compare to anything that we know here. Now, he's, he's writing this to people who also, Corinth was a very secular city, not too far from Athens, and it was a big port city where there was just a lot of sin, a lot like here in New York, right? Like, they call it Sin City for a reason. So these things are short-term. They're short-lived pains of this life, and they're creating for us an eternal glory that doesn't compare to anything in this world. What we have coming gives us the hope to keep pushing forward and listening to the voice of God. We did a prophetic conference here to help train people on how you can become better at hearing the voice of the Lord. And it's all still up online. You can, you can get it. It wasn't that long ago. All right, so this is good. 2 Corinthians 4, 18 says, So we don't set our sights on the things that we can see with our own eyes. All of that is fleeting. It will eventually fade away. Instead, we focus on the things that we cannot see. Like, if I said that to somebody on the day job, they'd be like, dude, like, that doesn't even make sense. Like, what are you talking about? How can you focus on something you can't see? That's a contradiction. And Christianity does seem like a contradiction to a lot of people. For the little bit of the, of the experimentation, they might have even looked at it. They kind of write it off quickly. But what does it say? Like, you know, if you get questioned, but Hebrews 1, 11 1 says, Now faith is the substance of the things that you hope for, the evidence of things not seen. So God gives us evidence of this unseen world. What would that be? Also in the book of Hebrews, we're surrounded by a great, what? Well, what, what was he talking about? All the people that are, that are listed in chapter 11 as examples of people who by faith did this. By faith did that. The whole idea of you even getting saved had to be by faith. Because it doesn't really make sense, right? When I, my mother was witnessing to me, I'd say, man, do you believe in Noah's Ark? Like, really? You believe Jonah got swallowed by a whale? And... That's what people do. They try to rationalize all of this stuff. They don't recognize the immensity of God's miracle work in power. And, and one of the things that just came to me was the, the, the Hall of Fame in Hebrews 11. By faith, Abraham did what? Was willing to offer up his son. Believing, it says in another place, that God, even if the, even if the knife had come down, had enough faith to believe that God would raise him from the dead. Wow, you could build a good church with people like that. They're being obedient to the Lord. They're, and he didn't even have the written Bible. That's another day's topic. But there was enough of a, of, of a truth of the word in him that he knew he could trust God. Goes outside. God makes him this promise. I'm your exceeding great treasure, Abraham. Yeah. And we should all be living like that. Amen? <laughs> Could be a little bit of a surprise look on the guy's face on my job. Like, really? That's how I looked when I realized there was a spiritual war going on. It's like, oh my God, she's been right. The devil's been trying to take me out. And it wasn't long after that that I said yes, you know, because I recognized when that Galatians 5, when, when I understood there was a war going on, then my eyes were open and I didn't want to go do that stuff anymore. And my friends actually thought I got arrested and that, that I was called a narc. You know what a narc is? Like you're going to, you're going to, you're going to rat them out so you get a lesser sentence. <laughs> because there's no way you changed. You were leading the decadence. And now you're going to be a preacher. Right. It's got to be a scam. 